man. Uh, our man Matt George here. Matt uh, Kenny was Matt George, of course, host of the uh, very popular Locked On Kings podcast. Uh, Kenny said you were you were, you were pretty fired up Sunday night. I was, I was, and hi guys, always good to join you. What's up, um, God, I, I'm trying to remember all the bad losses recently. Which one was Sunday's? Let's that see. That was Memphis. Memphis, oh. that was the 27 down by as many as 37. I think the uh, title was pathetically predictable. Yes. Yep, that's exactly what it was. A hundred percent. Yes, you're uh, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I, I, I was fired up. I was, I was frustrated because uh, the reason why I called it pathetically predictable is, is, is it's a loss and it's a start to that game that we've seen a million times, which is like, at least I knew coming into that game, look, the Kings just came off of two really solid wins, including a triple overtime victory in LA. There's every excuse in the book, including three starters missing a De'Aaron playing over 50 minutes in that game. Uh, an earlier start. There's every excuse in the book for the Sacramento Kings to get off to a poor start in this game. Uh, even if coach Alvin Gentry is saying, Hey, this, we know how this team's going to come out. We have to be ready. We have to be ready. Insert every Kings coach of the last 15 years who said the exact same thing with games like this. And the Kings come out and are down 11 to start. Like it's, it's like, it's easy to know what this Kings team is going to do. The amount of money that I could make on Sacramento <laughs> Kings basketball, the amount of money that Kings fans I'm sure do make betting on Sacramento Kings basketball. Cause this team, like the title says, is pathetically predictable when it comes to games uh, like Sunday in Memphis. Very frustrating. I'm with you, Matt. And and we all, the definition of predictable, we saw this coming. You talked about all the excuses that they had. And the frustrating thing for me was it feels like they, it feels like they leaned on those excuses, right? Like they were like, well, you know, we have the excuse. We got Friday in the back pocket and we're just, you know, we're tired. And, you know, the time changed, like, yeah, yeah, it's it's we we got the built-in excuse and that just can't happen. <laughs> like you have to be able to overcome those excuses or built-in excuses or whatever the case may be and not like winning maybe is asking too much, but you can't get beat up like that. That that was frustrating to see. Kenny, I'll say they played like that. I haven't heard them make any excuses. No, no, I haven't either. I didn't hear them say that. I'm just saying that's what it seemed like. It seemed like they bought in mentally and emotionally to those excuses. They haven't said anything uh, of that kind at all. You have to, you kind of have to, as a Kings fan, condition yourself to believe stuff like that. Because if you don't, you just have to accept that your team is awful. <laughs> Like those are the two choices. Believe mm -hmm. that they were that they, they, they were mentally checked out, or they do in fact stink that bad. I mean, it, it might honestly be a combination of both. It probably is a combination of both. But in in reality, that team doesn't. Like, they, they they're not thirty seven points worth worse than than Memphis. They're well, not. I I agree. I I agree. But they're still a a a team that I think Kenny said it before or said it before. They're extremely fragile both physically and emotionally and, and i'm not necessarily talking about fragile in terms of injuries because up until this point the, the kings have actually done a really good job staying healthy so far this season that's what's been most concerning is games that they've gotten their ass absolutely kicked like i don't know losing to a Philadelphia 76ers team, or what do you call them, Damian? The 53rd, uh, three years or whatever? Scranton 52ers. The, the Scranton 52ers. Yeah, losing to the Scranton 52ers, and you're completely healthy. I mean, there, there's no excuse yeah. for that game other than you just played terrible, and you played how we expect the Kings to play when they play uh, against lesser competition. And I use that with air quotes now because I've fallen into the trap. I know we've all fallen into the trap where we're looking at the schedule. We looked at that three, three four-game road trip at the early part of the season, I went, this is a game where, or this is a trip where the Kings really can make up some ground. This is where they have to go three and one, but they easily could go four. No hell. Tristan Thompson said that the very same thing. We can't look at this team and say things like that. They haven't earned that right They're They're, they're not good enough uh, to say things like that to the point where now guys, the Kings started the season with like the, the sixth hardest schedule in the NBA. And now, and we know how they got off to a five and four start in the first nine games, which was a pleasant surprise for a lot of us. Now, for the remainder of this season, the Sacramento Kings have the 21st easiest or the 21st hardest schedule, I should say. Mm. Like, that doesn't excite me if I'm a Sacramento Kings fan. Hell, I want it to be the hardest schedule in the league because maybe this team will actually show up and play like they do against the Lakers in LA. Maybe they'll do it tonight. Who the hell knows with this team? I mean, it just, it's, 
I, I almost feel more confident with this Kings team playing against Milwaukee, Phoenix, Utah, Los Angeles than I do against teams like Oklahoma City and San Antonio. If you're going to get blown out, get blown out by a team that's actually good. How are you getting blown out and or blowing an 18-point lead to Oklahoma City or getting blown out by San Antonio or losing to Philly at home with uh, with all those players missing? It just it doesn't make sense, but for those who've watched the Kings for the last 15 years, for the last five years, it mm. does make sense. Yeah. Why are they so inconsistent? What, yeah. like, what, like, I mean, you can, I mean, I know, and I understand that's a dumb question because you could probably pick 20 different things and you've done podcasts and we'll do podcasts on all of them over there on the, on the, on the locked on network. But is there something in, 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 and we'll go the Kyle Draper route. We'll, we'll throw Memphis out because there's, there's nothing you can pick apart in that game. It was just an absolute disaster. But when you look back at, you know, say Philadelphia or, uh, Utah, Minnesota, whatever, some of those games that they lost, like what, what's, what's standing out to you the most? Two things jump to mind. Number one is, and I know you guys have talked about this, this core, Ha, are, there are a lot of very talented individual players on this this Kings core. I've said I think this Kings core, this Kings roster is one of the best that they've had, maybe the best that they've had over this entire playoff drought. Mm -hmm. But they don't play well together. They just don't. Like Buddy Heald does not work with De'Aaron Fox. I, we are already questioning whether De'Aaron Fox and Tyrese Halliburton work together. De'Aaron Fox and Rashawn Holmes don't seem to work together clearly as, as well as Rashawn Holmes and Tyrese Halliburton work together. Uh, Harrison Barnes, you think, can fit into any, uh, any uh, roster, and he's a Swiss Army knife, and he's been very solid for the Kings. I'm not blaming him at all. For some reason, this group of players that is very talented, they just do not play well together so that's number one uh, and then number two is i think it's all up here i think it's all attitude i think it's all mindset uh and the fact that we can hear these players and you're going to be able to pick up on on who i'm talking about pretty quickly here we can hear them say we got to do this better we got to play defense everybody's got to do their job blah 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 and then they're the ones not playing better not doing their job uh it, it's 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 I just think it's a very uh, uh, like mentally fragile team, a team that makes the same mistakes over and over again, can't help but trip over their own feet. Uh, and, and then when it happens again, instead of saying, okay, we, we've we done this before, let's learn from this in the moment, they shut down or they give up or they fall back into old bad habits. Like, I don't know, taking 49 three-pointers or however many it was and, and making only seven of them and thinking, hey, we're down 30, who cares? Who gives it? You know what? Let's just chuck them up and maybe some will go in and we'll get our way get ourselves back in this game. Which, I mean, I, I guess I could blame coaching for that. Hell, I, Luke Walton was blamed for stuff like that. So is Alvin Gentry blamed for that now? Well, that's a culture thing. That has been pretty consistent here in Sacramento. Not necessarily the three-point shooting. That's been an ugly trend recently. Mm -hmm. But that's been a culture issue with this organization, regardless of head coach for over a decade. So I mean, it's just it's it's in the it's it's part of the in the floorboards of the the Golden One Center and the floorboards of, of any court built here in Sacramento that these kind of issues persist and nobody is strong enough to fix it. And the ones, the young guys, and I mean, look, look at the case of De'Aaron Fox. De'Aaron comes in here, loving here, loving it, knows the fans want him here, wants to be here. His second season, he does that player's tribute video saying, hey, Sacramento, we're going to fight for you. We're going to give it your all. We're going to give you 100%. And we believed him. We kind of saw it, even if the team wasn't playing well. Now, nobody can say that De'Aaron Fox is giving 100%. Hell, you could question if he's giving 75%, especially on the defensive side of the floor. Like, And De'Aaron looks like he's lost the joy, the energy, the passion that he's had uh, for playing the game and wanting to make it work. Now his head is hung. He looks frustrated. And I've never seen him more pissed off with the media in my life. So it's just that that's what the city does to players. I mean, Marvin Bagley carried a ball around with him everywhere he went as a rookie. Now he's like as checked out as it can possibly be here in Sacramento, hoping to get big moments like he got against Portland uh, to to build his stock so he can go and get playing time elsewhere. Like there's just, it's not the fans. We know that it's not necessarily the city. It's just this organization ha has a way of draining uh, these players to where they just, they need a fresh start to ha look like they have any hope. And I don't, I don't know what it is here. It's funny. You can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's funny you say that because I can understand that. Like, I get it. But also at the same time, these players have a direct impact on whether or not you're winning or losing. Like, it, like if you play defense better or – if you can make your free throws or you might win games. 
if you, you know what I mean? Like you don't, I know a lot of people feel like Sacramento's just, uh, you know, basketball hell and it starts up top and ownership and all this other stuff. And there is a level of merit to that, I guess. I'm not in it, so I, I don't know, but I can understand where somebody feels that way. But because Sacramento's basketball hell, you're just not going to play defense and you're going to lose like that. You you have an, an impact on whether or not you're looked at as a losing team or player or whatever the case may be. And that's just what I don't understand when people say those things. Yeah, but I also think a lot of players know that, and we've seen the Bagley camp try and use it. I mean, I played for Sacramento. Oh, it was Sacramento. It was the Kings. Like that's that we talk about excuses. That's an excuse that a lot of players, a card that a lot of players can play mm -hmm. that 29 other teams and fan bases will, will buy into Absolutely. And, be and believe it's like, yeah, yeah. It, it was Sacramento. Like everybody and their mother believes that once Marvin Bagley leaves Sacramento, he's going to go somewhere and he's going to become something. Will he actually, we don't know, but look at how many players have gone from Sacramento to be successful. Look how many players have been successful, come to Sacramento and forgotten how to be successful. Like Marco Bellinelli is one that jumps, uh, jumps to mind. George Hill, Dwayne Dedman, although Dwayne wasn't the best before the Kings, but you, you get my point. Like the only thing that makes logical sense to me, Kenny, is guys like De'Aaron come here. They want to give their all. They want to fight. And I'm not making an excuse for De'Aaron by any means because his defense has been absolutely atrocious. His attitude has been piss poor, especially as the, the leader of this team who, who's currently on a max contract. Like De'Aaron doesn't look like it, it, it matters to him. It looks like to De'Aaron Fox that it's not worth it for him mm. to play that hard. Like I could get hurt or we're not going to win anyway. Or what's the point? Like I'm going to let Russell Westbrook walk to the rim. It's not worth it for me to try and stop Russell uh, at this point in time, even if this is a game that we're in because we're going to miss the playoffs anyway. And I'm not saying De'Aaron is money motivated because I, I, I believe, yeah, he, he had this contract in the bag last season when he had his, his, his best mm -hmm. season. So it's not mm -hmm. like, oh, he just got paid. Now he doesn't care anymore. And I, I, I think I know a little bit about De'Aaron Fox, the person. I don't think that is his chief motivation. But I think he does look around here in Sacramento and go, man, this is year five of this. You know what? I'm tired of it. What's the point of me giving 110% defensively if guys beside me aren't going to do it and it, it might not matter? And then the guys beside are seeing their leader doing that and going, well, if he's not going to do it, I'm not going to do it either. So it's just a vicious circle almost. Yeah. That it's not feels... an excuse either. It's not an excuse. It's it's unacceptable, but I can uh, like that's the only mindset that makes sense with how consistent it's been for how many players have come through Sacramento. You really think De'Aaron feels that way? I hope not. It but it, it makes sense. Like what else could it be that he's just forgotten how to play or that like what Well, other... he's not playing that bad. I think I think that's the the thing. Now defensively yeah, I, I don't know what to say. I, I honest to God, don't like. I don't know what to say about that dude defensively. Yeah, but like overall, he, he no, he's not. He's certainly not what he was last year. He's closer to what he was at the beginning of last year. I know we kind of ignore that part of the season, but it's not. Again, you know, Darren's not great right now, but he's not awful. He's not Donovan Mitchell. He's not Jason Tatum. He's not any of those guys he's going to inevitably get compared to because of the contract that he got. But I also don't look at De'Aaron and go, this dude's trash. No, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Not, not at all. I think that the two things that I point to, D'Lo, are one, the defensive effort, um, which speaks for itself. Number two is, like, it's not just that, uh, I think you said it yesterday or the other day, like, De'Aaron, where's De'Aaron's burst, right? Where's that mm -hmm. burst that De'Aaron's known for? The explosiveness. We haven't seen that. But it's not just like he looks a step slower, but he's still trying I think I've seen once this season De'Aaron get a defensive rebound or get an outlet pass, put his head down, and try and beat everybody up the floor. He used to do that once a game. I think mm -hmm. he's done it once this season. It's like, De'Aaron, even if, you, you, if you've lost a step and you get beat up the floor, okay, so be it. But I haven't seen him try and put his head down and, and, and turn on the Jets and try and beat anybody up the floor. I haven't seen him try and turn a corner with the super aggressiveness. Now it looks, he looks smoother. It looks like he's gliding. He kind of glides his way to his spots and has that step back mid range jumper that when it's on, it's a deadly shot, but most of the cities and it's been short off the front of the rim. Like he, he kind of glides and he's a lot smoother and he's gotten better at reading defenses. So he still is effective. I agree with Damien. Uh, he's not horrible, but the when I question the effort, 
obvious on the defensive end. I don't have to talk about that anymore. And then offensively, it's like, okay, you're known for this burst. You're known for this speed. And you don't even look like you're trying to use it or you're trying to find it. You just kind of look like you're, you're gliding and picking your spots and, 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 and choosing when to burst and when not to, which we know at times when he was a, a rookie and a young player, his burst got him in trouble and he was out of control at times. So he's definitely under more control but at the sacrifice almost completely of that burst, of that explosiveness that made him the NBA player and the star that we thought he could be, and and, and I still believe he can be. Oh, well, that's what I was going to follow up with you. Do you think that that player is gone forever or he can come back? And I don't mean just production-wise, but the way he plays the game, um, the level of intensity that he had at one time. Do you think that guy is just gone and he's figuring out a different way to play? Um, or can something trigger him to, to come back to that? I, I mean, I don't think it's possible to say a 23-year-old has lost that and will never get back to that. I mean, he's he's not even sniffed his prime yet, uh, theoretically, and he's still got so much athleticism in the tank, or at least he should. Now, I know he also plays banged up all the time. Quick note, make, Matt. Quick yeah. note. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt. It does pertain to the game tonight. Shams just tweeted, and this probably is horrible news for Sacramento. LeBron James has entered health and safety protocols. Yikes. And he is out tonight versus Sacramento. Well, that'll be a bummer for the 9,000 Laker fans in attendance tonight. Sorry, guys. Russell Westbrook about to go off. No, he's going to try go and go off. I he's might have to be in the off. arena tonight. <laughs> Russell Westbrook is going to take 30 shots, and he's either going to finish with 40 points or he's going to finish with 10. That's watch, how, that's how watch, tonight's going to go. Well, all right. That, to Matt, that was Matt George. Thanks to Matt George for joining us. Like, <laughs> um, Yeah, so LeBron James has entered health and safety protocols, and Man. he is out tonight versus Sacramento. That's crazy. Sorry, King. Like, I mean, I – It's over. Rivalry, whatever, like game. Like, I, I know Kings. <laughs> people come to see come, people come to see LeBron James. That's tough, man. So who's it going to be? Is it going to be Malik Monk with thirty plus? Is it going to oh, be? Malik it's Malik Tucker? Monk. It's Kenny's man crush. Yeah, it's, Malik it's, it's, it's Malik Monk. Monk. So yeah. it's Malik Monk with the revenge over his teammate, even though they're still friends, I guess. Uh, uh, you know, Horton Tucker. It could be him as well. Uh, it, tonight seems like a great night for Avery Bradley to decide he knows how to play well, offense. Well, I thought he was out. Is he out? Well, hell, he'll still score somehow. <laughs> <laughs> now that sucks because I mean, any, anytime, and, and I've been very, very fortunate enough in my life, as I think you guys have as well, to to be able to see LeBron play a number of times. And even if uh, I'm not the biggest LeBron fan in the world, with the antics of the poor guy gets poked in the eye and is basically blind at this point <laughs> in his career because he, with the amount of times he gets poked, he in the saw eye three game. rims, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Steph Curry. He told Steph, my eye, my eye. <laughs> Iconic moment. Iconic. Yeah, nice. Um, oh, okay. That's Matt George, everybody, host of the Locked On Kings podcast. Kyle, <laughs> Matt's gotten Matt's gotten kicked off twice in the same conversation. <laughs> Kyle Madsen just took over my body for a second. I took over my, my, <laughs> there my, you go. Um, but yeah, it's a bummer because anytime you have the opportunity to watch LeBron James play in person, even uh, even at this point in his career, it, it's a treat. So uh, that's a that's a bummer for fans who are going. I, I don't feel bad for the many Laker fans who are going to be in attendance tonight. Although I actually am curious about that from your guys' perspective because I know a lot of Kings fans hate how much Laker Nation, who might actually be Warriors fans this year, um, how much they show up at the Golden <laughs> One Center for for Kings Lakers games. But I, I like the environment. I've always liked the Kings-Lakers environment, kind of the, the yelling back and forth. Um, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I, I'm always energized to be in the Golden 1 Center when it's 50-50. Same thing with Warriors crowds. Like when it's 50-50 and you can't tell who's the home team every time some, someone scores, like I, I kind of like it. It just is fun for me. Yeah, I don't have a problem with it. it it's fun in theory, except for the fact that the Kings <laughs> never win those games. Yeah, that's so that a good point. Make the knock fun. But, I mean, those times when, like, the Lakers were terrible, you know, before LeBron got there and the Kings would beat up on them and there'd still be a lot of Laker fans in there, yeah, that was a good time. Yeah, we got for the sure. bogey moment that stepped back over Tristan Thompson was, that was shut was up half that cool. building. Yeah, very so cool. happy for bogey. <laughs> we've gotten so many really good. I know this is nothing to do with tonight's game, but we've gotten so many good, actually Kings warriors battles inside the golden one center over its short history, especially when Durant was still here. There was one season where all four Kings warriors games, I think were decided by like two or three points. Like that was the same year that we had like the Justin Jackson versus Steph Curry shootout for no freaking reason. Yeah. Um, remember that, that was, one? 
Steph both made ja Justin fall with a jab step. I, I want to point out that's not a sentence you could say anywhere in the other <laughs> in, in anywhere in the NBA country <laughs> other than Sacramento. Oh, can you say Steph Curry, uh, Omer Caspi shootout? Yeah, no, nope. I remember that. <laughs> Sacramento only. These that are in, these are these are Sacramento exclusives right here. That was an Oracle, <laughs> but um, I mean that that season there was a lot of really good. I don't know. I mean, it just speaks to the Kings, right? The Kings playing up to the level of their competition. When the Warriors came into town, they played hard. When the Lakers come into town, typically they play hard. They don't always win, but at least they play hard. So, and that's um, the I, and and Kenny, you know, Kenny and I were talking about this earlier, man. That's one of the maddening things about all of this is mm -hmm. we have no idea how the LeBron James, you know playing or not he's he's not playing but whether he was or he was, we have no idea how the kings are going to come out tonight we don't know if they're going to be that same team that played portland on wednesday the lakers on friday or if they're going to be the team that went down 11 0 and wanted us all to go back to the red zone channel on sunday afternoon <laughs> hell deal how about not just the game how about every quarter <laughs> i mean sure, I, I, see, yeah. I see the kings put up 36 and a quarter and go okay now that they've taken a five minute break and we went to it's, commercial, what are they going to be? <laughs> it's <laughs> like, like you have to hold your breath the first yeah. two and a half, three minutes of each uh, uh, of the game of the half of the th the third quarter and m maybe the fourth quarter too. <laughs> you just kind of, <laughs> all right, guys, let's, I'm, I, I, I suddenly feel like the announced team with Buddy Heald. Come on, guys, just hit that first basket. <laughs> Everything will be okay if you just hit the first basket. Well, well, how about when a team goes on a 6-0 run? I'm like, oh, my gosh. It's where over. is this going to go? <laughs> is this going to turn into a 15-2 run? <laughs> well, it's funny. As a 6-0 start for the Kings, it's either going to turn into they're going to come back and 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 keep the game even at the end of the first quarter, and it'll still feel like they got their butts kicked, or they mm -hmm. will get their butts kicked, and, it, and it's over by the end of the first quarter. Like, the Kings have an incredible knack of – of they do two things really, really well. They – will go uh they will go down big early and fight their way back without looking good or they will take a lead early and it evaporates by the time you get up to go to the bathroom like it, it it's just a talent that this king's team has of hey they have a 10 point lead early and they're either tied or down by the end of the quarter for no reason it's just it's a very it's a king's trait mm -hmm. one of many yeah it's a mad I wonder I wonder if I was going to say if this was, you know, maybe the the inspiration, so to speak. And and I gave I, I was going to say inspiration for this team to like be like, hey, we're going to go here and win this thing. I don't want to make it like if they saw LeBron, they thought they had no chance. You know what I mean? Like, because I, I don't I don't believe that. But maybe this is something we're coming off of. Um, Alvin Gentry trying to tell them, hey, Memphis is going to be ready, and they weren't ready to go. Now they look at something like LeBron not playing, and they'll say, hey, we know that uh, everybody thinks that it'll be easy with LeBron, but those guys are going to come out to play. No, actually, listen this time. Maybe I'm grasping for straws for reasons to see this team to be motive for this team well, you to, love straws. to come in here. <laughs> but, I mean... <laughs> They can't come out flat again tonight. Like, I know they can, but come on, man. You just got you are incorrect, Mr. Caraway. They can, in fact, come out flat two games in a row. <laughs> come on, man. I just, I wonder what anybody can tell them because we know that there are smart basketball players in that locker room. We know that De'Aaron Fox and, uh, I hope Harrison Barnes is playing tonight. I haven't heard anything. Like, yeah, I, don't I don't think, think so. Uh, well, yeah, James James said uh, earlier it was doubtful. Yeah, okay. Well, regardless, we know everybody in that locker room recognizes the inconsistencies of this team, recognizes how this team falls into the same mistakes and uh, same traps every single game. I mean, hell, if the fan base can figure it out and predict it, we know it's a conversation, a topic on that bench and in that locker room. And yet they can say everything they want and say, hey, we, we can't do this. We we got to overcome this. We can't come out flat. This team's going to come out energized now that their star and LeBron are one of their stars and LeBron is out. Uh, but it's it's another thing entirely for this team to do. And I think that's the most frustrating thing is if I were Alvin Gentry, if I were Luke Walton, I would feel powerless. And I think that's where the frustration comes from, especially Kenny, you and I have talked about um, the the how much is on the coach and how much is on the players like. Luke can only stare them in the face and say, guys, let's not let this happen. Alvin can only say so many times, hey, Memphis is going to come out and play hard because they're missing draw and they just got uh, Ja Morant and they just got their ass kicked. Like, be ready. And the players aren't. Like, there's only so much you can say you actually have to go out and do. 
And right. that's the problem with this Kings team. They know what the problems are. Everybody knows what the problems are watching this team. It doesn't take that bright of a basketball mind to figure it out. But execution-wise, they're incapable of figuring it out or adapting when things aren't going their way. Like they they just there's no such thing as a counter punch in Sacramento. It's either punch first or get punched TKO, you're done. Like that's how mm. it is with, with the Kings, it seems like. That's a good analogy. Like if they don't punch first, they're gonna be picking themselves up <laughs> off the canvas uh <laughs> repeatedly uh for the next three and a half quarters. Looking like Nate Robinson. <laughs> well, no, Nate just didn't give up. I used the analogy of Trevor Burbick when Mike Tyson got him. He kept trying to get up. He did everything he could. He'd get up. He'd fall back down. He'd get up. He'd fall. Kind of like Michael Spinks did in the 91 second fight. He just fell through the ropes, but he tried to get back up. Nate Robinson just face planted and didn't get up. That was Sunday. What the yeah. Kings did against yeah. Memphis, that was Nate Robinson. They, they were just down. Good. It was over. It's it's uh, that the Ric Flair gif where he puts his fists up and just falls flat forward yeah. when he's like 65 <laughs> years old. It's the old face plant gif. But but it, and, and I guess. You know that that's the that's the bigger issue is everybody's been able to identify these problems. Now you have two head coaches being able to identify these problems. You have new coaches coming into the staff at the beginning of the year being able to identify these problems. And yet from last year, or as Kenny would point out, the last two, three years, you've been unable to fix them. And now you're 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 creeping out of well, it's not everything was Kenny says this Kenny, everything was supposed to be better when Vlade was fired. Okay. All right, now everything's supposed to be better now that Luke's fired. No, all this stuff looks exactly the same. Same. And I'm running out of places to look. I can certainly look at ownership and all of that, but that speaks to a different issue. I'm talking about on the court. Mm -hmm. There's only one place left to look. You can't blame anybody else. Like this is on this is on the players. And my concern is if they haven't fixed it yet, what makes us believe they're going to? I also question especially when it comes to offense and offensive schemes, which is supposed to be the primary strength of this Kings team. Remember guys, it's that's all, a lie. That's mm. all we heard. And that's all hell I said on the podcast. Like the offense is going to be fine. We've heard so many players and coaches say the offense is going to be fine. If defense could be a little bit better, hell we're, we're where we want to be, but the offense is going to be fine. Like I I'm concerned and confused by high basketball IQ players and some low basketball IQ players and even coaching staff thinking that continuing to just chuck up three pointers and live or die by the three point shot offensively is, is, is the right move. Like we know this Kings team under Luke Walton, they weren't the best at adjustments. They've, they've seemed to have gotten a little bit better adjusting under Alvin Gentry. But like I said, in that Memphis game, there was no adjustment with, with three point shots. It was literally just, well, there's nothing else we can do. Like I listening to Katie Christensen on the broadcast, how frustrated she's getting saying like, get to the paint, try and get something around the rim, please. God, like try. That's supposed to be the, uh, one of the strengths of, of, of your team, especially with De'Aaron Fox, like get to the rim, start there instead right. of starting on the perimeter. Like that's where I question coaching with this team. That's where I question just basketball IQ period is, how in the world do you guys think that like that strategy has worked once when you scored 140 points on Charlotte? And I know we would love to see that happen on a nightly basis because we know that team is capable of that, but that's best case scenario. And the Kings are not good enough to think that they're going to consistently get best case scenario. So as fun as it was to put up 140 points and hit 23 or 15 threes or whatever it was against Charlotte, like, that's it's not going to happen consistently for you. So you have to know that with that shots, not falling early, you have to adjust. And it's not just one guy, although buddy healed is, is, is captain Chuck a three. It's not just him. It's everybody coming in and, and settling for that outside shot. And it's, it, it's baffling to me. That would be <laughs> irresponsible. If I didn't, <laughs> you're going to drop. Cap Mando, Chuck a three. You got to, you got to drop it. Drop it. Matt, I got to ask you, and I don't know is not an answer. Do you have to? Can we, just, can we talk what about something Kings, else? What Kings team comes out and, and shows their face tonight? I'll go first. I think they'll be ready. I think they'll be leading it at the end of the first quarter. How about Whoa, that? Oh, wow. Yeah. You got both. So, yeah. you know what? I might have gone that route. Like, oh, they, they, they're going to come out. Until LeBron got ruled <laughs> out. Now I'm like, oh. So, Anthony David, like Car Carmelo going to look like, oh, you know, Carmelo going off Denver tonight. Nuggets, Carmelo, like something bad is going to happen. Russell's going crazy tonight. 
So Kenny Caraway, what you're telling me is you put two hundred thirty-five thousand dollars on the Kings leading after the first quarter. Is that what you're telling me? I mean, I mean that's that's just a pair of them them Chicago's he got on right now. Like I didn't know. Like y'all can't see this on the stream. I just saw it. It just popped up on the feed. My man got the full. He got the full gear on. He could, would you bet them Chicago's that you're wearing on your feet that the Kings are leading after one? No. <laughs> gotta, hit him. gotta hit him with the Friday. Hit him with uh with uh Red's uh dad. No. Uh so to answer your question, Kenny, like it, it, it only makes sense for the Lakers. I, I I think the atmosphere has a lot to do with it because that tonight might be the most full the building's been maybe since the, the home opener, which wasn't even that full. Like we've talked about before how empty the Golden One Center has been so far this season, and, and we know there are gonna be a lot of Kings and Lakers fans in attendance. There always are for games like this. Like I, I think the atmosphere mixed with uh, the, the team getting just getting blown out, mixed with playing a, a team like the Lakers. Um, I, I think the Kings. I think tonight's game is going to be a close game. I'm not necessarily predicting a Kings win, but I think it's going to be close. I think it's going to come down to the wire. I think it, it makes a lot of sense for the Kings to be in control of this game for a long time, and then for there to be 18 lead changes in the final seven minutes of this game. Like it just seems that's that's the, the the sense that I have. Not predicting a Kings win or a Kings loss, so I'm fin sitting there. But I think the Kings are going to be close. Uh, this game is going to be closed, or the Kings are going to be in control for a lot of this game, and then the fourth quarter will will flip a coin. Hmm. Y'all are a little bit cowardly. I mean, I'm saying <laughs> y'all just just kind of hedging your bets here. <laughs> but let's go ahead. Let's 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 speak truth to power here, because we've got our keys to the game. Oh. Brought to you by Sac City Mortgage. <laughs> Unlock your homeowner dreams with the People's Lender. Sac City Mortgage. Dot com. Here's one thing that we learned on Friday, guys. Uh, Anthony Davis apparently is is a really bad shooter right now. Cool. Let's keep making Anthony Davis shoot threes. Now, Rashawn Holmes is not listed on the injury report, so all indications are he's back. So the makeup of who Anthony Davis is going to see is going to look a little bit different uh, tonight. And I imagine he's going to get a little bit more touch with LeBron James out. So let's force Anthony Davis away from the basket and allow him to continue that poor shooting trend. I like any, that. You got some, you, you got a key you want to throw in here. We got, we got keys for everybody, but you get I, any other way the Kings can win. Hey, win the fast break battle. I want to see them get out and run. I want to see them get that offense going. Even if the defense isn't going to be there, let's get the offense cooking, man. And they're at home. Like we talked about the crowd's going to be there. It's going to be an electric atmosphere. Use that to your advantage. Why have they stopped? Matt, I'm going to ask you this. Keys to the game brought to you by Sac City Mortgage. Unlock your homeowner dreams with the people's lender, SacCityMortgage.com. Why has this team stopped running? Beats me. <laughs> I, it doesn't make sense. It does not. It's it's the primary strength of this team. Everybody said, or we heard, like we talked talked about, the primary strength is this team offensively. No, the primary strength of this team is transition. And when they get defensive stops, uh, that's when they get out in transition. And maybe that's the th maybe that's it. They're not getting as many defensive stops. So they're not running as much. But even when they are getting defensive stops, you'll see De'Aaron walking the ball up the floor. And I think it was caught. I think Alvin Gentry was caught in one of these games screaming on the sideline saying, go, go, go. And Fox was walking the ball up the floor or at least a light jog up the floor. I don't know. Like that's, that's where it's like, that's where I question the effort, not just from Fox from, from this team period. Like what's the point of us pushing here? Like, I'm just going to waste energy and, and, and nothing good is going to come out of it. Like that's again, the only logical explanation. Cause we know this team is smart enough to recognize it's one of their strengths, but are they willing to do it? And it doesn't look like they're willing. It's hard to ignore the number of times that that's happened. You mentioned the Alvin Gentry thing. Uh, Kenny and I talked about the 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 clip where Tyrese was begging for the ball, like the, 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 give me the ball, give me the ball, I'm an inbound, give me the ball, give me the ball. He gets the ball, he throws it to to De'Aaron. Tyrese takes up the floor, and De'Aaron walks the walks the <laughs> ball up the floor, just like Russell Westbrook walked the ball into the lane uh, on Friday and 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 laid it in. Uh, it's hard to ignore that he seems to be uh, the, the centerpiece. I'm not turning heel on De'Aaron. I'm just saying it's odd that he seems to be uh, at the centerpiece a lot of a lot of these questions we have about the Kings offense. When we've always been told speed is his most unique asset. It's what separates him. And he's just like, I don't really want to use it. Hmm. Guys, do we do we bury the the term head of the snake now, or do we retire that yes. term now that uh, Luke Walton is gone? Because that was yes. Luke Walton's term that he introduced to everybody. So yeah. that that term is gone. So what is De'Aaron now? The 
Well, he was the straw that stirs the drink, but there it is. Uh, we don't have a straw right he's, now. He's a player. We ain't even got a drink. <laughs> we, we need one. We got some ice cubes that are melting. That's you that's got, what we got. Y'all got plenty behind you. You got to share with the rest of the fan base. <laughs> oh man, we're, we're always happy to share that. Luke Belair, McQueen, and the Violet Fog, and Violin and Bumble Rum. Y'all I'm more than happy to share that. Uh, and Matt, we're happy that you uh, shared your time here with us. Of course, you could check out the Locked On Kings podcast. Hopefully. Hopefully, hopefully, a happier edition of the Locked on Kings podcast tonight following the game. I will say, like, Locked on Kings had, um, if I can brag a little bit, Locked on Kings had their, their our best week ever last week, like, Very to nice. where it, it was, um, like, just a massive week, uh, and a top 10 in all of our NBA uh, podcasts on the Locked on Network, which just speaks to the, the, the fan base. And unfortunately, I think... Glutton five, for punishment. Yeah, I think four <laughs> out of the five episodes were pissed off ranty Matt George. Yep. So I, I, I don't there want that to happen. But hey, if that brings numbers, Kings, keep on losing. Let's get a 30-point well, okay. Laker come, victory tonight. Okay, come, settle. Come, okay. Come on. Okay. All right, Matt's been, <laughs> Matt's been banned. We'll see y'all tomorrow Sucks. at noon.